All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming here. Um, this is my second talk in this Guadalajara, and the second talk that happens after lunch. So I also hope not a lot of people get asleep here. <laughs> um, so yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Georges, um, but people also call me Greg. Um, it's a historical sort of artistic name that I has a funny story, but it does not fit this presentation. But I'm also um, called Fernandon on IRC. And oh, I don't know if all of you actually know who I am, so I brought some of my credentials to be talking about what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I identify myself as a GNOME developer because I develop things for GNOME. Um, I also identify myself as a maintainer because I maintain some of the things that I contribute to. I'm also a contributor because I do not maintain some of the things that I contribute to. And also I'm a user because I do not contribute to everything that I use. I identify as a public outreacher for GNOME. Um, I, do not, I do not miss a single chance to advocate for GNOME when I have the chance. And on the free time, I try to be a human after all, although that's harder than it sounds like. Um, so, uh, first, a disclaimer. I think this is pretty obvious by now, but um, if, in case it's not, the views and thoughts and opinions here are my own, and they will be biased. In fact, um, this whole presentation is um, modeled on top of my career, if we can call it th like that, as a maintainer and a contributor. Um, so everything here is going to be biased um, to what I've um, personally experienced. Um, and it seems like a trend in this Guadec, but I have many questions. I have so little answers. Um, so yeah, I, I do not claim to have answers for what I'm going to propose here as questions. Um, and hopefully this can become a productive discussion or not. I don't know. I hope so. If you identify with any situations um, here, please let me know on or offline, because I, I think it's important to talk about these issues, um, and you, you know why later on. So yeah, so let's begin. So here's a quick timeline of how things unrolled for me. So my first contribu contribution happened in 2011. That's eight years ago now. Um, I started contributing as a translator. And then I went to GNOME Calendar, contributing to GNOME Calendar. Um, in 2015, I created GNOME To Do as a way to cope with my deep inability to organize my own tasks on paper. Um, and it turns out that GNOME To Do is a great way to procrastinate while still feeling productive because you're writing a tool to feel productive. <laughs> um, also in 2015, um, I started contributing to GNOME Music, and 2016 was the year that I started on settings, and also on Mutter GNOME Shell. So it's quite a big number of things. Um, in the beginning, when I didn't know about GNOME, the very first thing that blew my mind, and I had a hard time recollecting myself after understanding the process, was the review process. So getting your code revealed by people that are more experienced than you are is such a fantastic way to receive feedback and improve your own abilities. And I think we, as a community, we should be proud of ourselves because we have a very solid um, review process. Um, yeah. I was warmly welcomed in the community, and I think this is something that we, as a community, should be proud of ourselves. When I started, there was no newcomers project. Um, and even then, um, I felt like warmly welcomed. Um, I think nowadays the situation is even better for new people. Um, th this was the period of my life that I had the highest number of ideas and the strongest motivation to get those ideas turned into code. And um, 
this might be controversial, but um, I feel like because I started contributing with features and not bug fixes, um, I was hooked into GNOME like immediately. Who here is a maintainer? Can you raise your hand who maintains something? Okay, of those maintainers who um, started contributing with bug fixing. Okay, almost half of it. So, biased. <laughs> So yeah, a totally unscientific graph about how my motivation went. <laughs> so that, just that you feel happy about <laughs> a chart. Okay, so this is how it started. And now, looking back um, at the same timeline, that's how, it, in the first timeline, that's how I become a contributor. But after starting contributing to GNOME Calendar, and after becoming the author of GNOME To Do, I became the maintainer of GNOME Calendar in 2015. Um, and after starting contributing to um, settings, I became the maintainer in 2018. Um, there in blue, there are three of them. It's a big number, despite being small. Um, so yeah, you're actually looking at the time life, uh, timeline of me going from a contributor to a maintainer. And yeah, at that time, before knowing the, you know, the bloody guts of being a maintainer, I think I had in my mind what I now call the mythical maintainer idea. So being a maintainer is kind of a status. So you do not achieve maintainership, at least from the eyes of an amateur that I was before becoming a maintainer. Um, Maintainer are reference points for new people. So it's who they look after when they want to start contributing or not, are they? Um, maintainers have the power to dictate under many codes um, the direction of a given project. Um, well, is this actually correct? Do, main do we have this power in absolute or not? And this one is a big one because um, because I don't know how much of that is because of the review process, but to me, um, a maintainer had a godlike status because of the amount of knowledge they had and the meaningful reveals that were provided to me to my code. Um, by that time, I thought, hey, these people are really good at what they do. Right. Otherwise, how would they give me so many good tips and, you know, find bugs in my code that I've been looking at, I don't know, two or three months and I couldn't find. So, yeah, after that, um, well, that's the expectation of you have to, of what is a maintainer and you face the reality when you become one. <laughs> Because the real life maintainer has a lot more to do and not everything is so shiny and exciting as adding new features. You know, when you, especially when you maintain things that other maintainers have to use, that's, that becomes a real problem. And of course, by becoming a maintainer, you learn the virtue, the virtue of love that some people have. And you get to see the real bad side of human, anonymous human beings um, on the internet, right? In fact, when I was um, mounting these, creating these slides, <laughs> when I was creating these slides, I was thinking about adding more. And fortunately, today, somebody gave me what I was looking for. Another example of the virtue of love. Um, so yeah, you've got to face that. It's not fun. You face that once and twice and thrice and four times and five times. And then that becomes hundreds and then that becomes thousands. And it stops being funny, you know, because we n now laugh when public exposed. But when you're, when you're alone at night at 2 a.m., 
and people think you're talking in a group saying about how you're going to release GNOME Calendar, which is, of course, a group of people doing QA and documentation and testing, but it's actually just you late at night saying, hey, just one more bug, please allow me to do that, buddy. It's not fun anymore. So, yeah. Um, lots of things start to pass through your mind, at least started to pass through my mind, and this was very recent. Um, I'm talking about this year. Um, fortunately, we had this, in this Guadec, um, we had a very important um, workshop on um, the, e, what's that called? Imposter. The imposter syndrome, that's right. Um, which is so timely with the slides that I prepared. <laughs> and we didn't even coordinate with that. Um, some maintainers endure this challenge, some fall. Some people just don't want to handle all of that, which is perfectly fine. I mean, especially when you're not getting paid to do that, especially when you don't gain anything by doing that, right? But most of us suffer by becoming maintainers. Um, of course, there's the imposter syndrome there's a lot of anxiety involved, especially when you don't know what lies ahead of you, when you think that being a maintainer is incredibly awesome and you don't get any actual training on that. And then you have to face those situations that we're not prepared to. So yeah, um, of course, for some of us, we may realize that the mythical maintainer is just a myth. Um, it's, it shouldn't be um, such a glorified position in my perspective. Um, and I keep thinking while doing this slide deck, um, what should I propose? What should I ask? Th those are hard questions because the problem domain is obtuse. It's not easy to think about it. Um, clearly when you're in the middle of the storm, right? I mean, looking at back now, I'm trying to make sense of all of that, ha all, all of what happened um, and try to shape a better future for being a maintainer in GNOME, perhaps in free software. I'm not aiming that high, but maybe. Um, so yeah, those are some questions that I came up with. Um, should we draft, I don't know, a maintainer's guideline? Um, what should a maintainer do, how a maintainer should behave, or at least um, guidelines of suggestions on how to handle these kind of situations. Should we prepare um, our maintainers, or people that want to maintain you know, modules um, for what comes ahead? Should we tell them that it's not, al not awesome, but it's not you know, hell, as long as you know what's gonna happen? Um, you can deal with it better. Um, so yeah, the second point here um, should be honest and trying to figure out what are the mechanisms um, in the community that still propagate this myth, if there's a myth at all, and or maybe this is just something that happened to me, but it's not a shared experience with anybody else. Um, are we still propagating this myth today? Um, what are the mechanisms that propagated and is there any way to mitigate those mechanisms? Um, the third point is audible, being audible. You know, let, let people hear you. Um, in February, I wrote a blog post. Um, it's called On Being a Free Software Maintainer. That's the pit of darkness that I was in the beginning of the year. Um, strongly reconsidering my decisions of being a maintainer and a contributor in free software entirely. And after writing that, it seems like um, that blog post resonated with a lot of people because um, the numbers are massive. The number of um, reshares and comments and things that follow ups that happen to that blog post are massive. So I don't know, perhaps that's an indication that we are not talking enough about a problem domain 
and a lot of people are being affected by this problem domain. Is that actually true? Um, should we um, should we encourage people in maintainership position to talk about these problems or not? Um, can we be more humane and let, um, I don't know, the internet anonymous folks know that there are actual human beings behind the computer? Is there any way we can do that or not? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that our that in this room there are various people with some pretty good ideas on how to do that, and I would be happy to hear them. That's the whole purpose of this presentation, in fact. The current state of GNOME is this. This is what we have in our wiki. Yeah, it's not exactly the most um, compre comprehensive guide to be a maintainer, right? I don't think add, adding your name to a dope file is going to prepare you for that. <laughs> Nor subscribing to the dev announce list. Yeah. Um, can we have strategies to prevent, react, and educate um, our people and external people about what's that um, so that we avoid, pro we avoid this problem by preparing people about the problem? Is that, is that an actual solution? Um, I don't know. I, I honestly do not know. Um, and I left this as a last phrase because I want to open the discussion here for, I don't know, potential ideas on this. But it's always darkest just before the day dawneth. Um, so yeah, this was short. Um, I hope we can open the space for um, some discussion, if you have anything to say. Okay, Siri has something to say. <laughs> okay, um, well, I think um, one thing is the role of a developer advocate, you know, it, they, they have it in corporate open source, uh, but we don't have it in free software in general. and. I think I primarily play that role, um, but it's that role is important because the developer advocate is not emotionally connected to the work being done, and thus it can have a much thicker skin when working with external people who don't have that and can provide that bit of this is the human, and they can explain because they know both sides; they understand what because they have a, a relationship with people internal to the project, but also have an understanding of what's going on on the internet. So I create, I have user profiles. When I'm, when I'm arguing, I could put them people in buckets. <laughs> I don't know which, which one, I mean, I, it, it, there's a, there's a psychology, psychology involved when, when you're doing advocacy. Um, and having, I'm unfortunately, I think there's only me that's doing it or, I, or have the ability to do it, but growing that and then formalizing that in some way, for instance, in GitLab, uh, when a, a, a merge request goes south, I think getting an engagement, a team member from the engagement team uh, to get and take care of it, you know, don't, don't waste your time. <laughs> we, so that's essentially DevComs, right? Developer, development communication, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, you're involved in GNOME for 20 years, right? Yeah, or something yeah. like that. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Did such a position exist when you started? No. Um, how I started this is um, initially um, when I joined the project, I wasn't allowed to do code contributions because my uh, employee contract said pretty much said any co code I write belong to the company I was working for. Um, that's changed, but uh, so I, I started just doing non-coding stuff. So uh, it just turned into advocacy because uh, when GNOME 3 came out, we I, there was a lot of time spent in GNOME 2 space. You, we're, basically, we, we're refighting the same battles we did back back in GNOME 2. It's just, it's the same stuff. <laughs> so, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't push back at, 
at that point at all because there was no there was no way to I mean we didn't really know but when Gnome three came out I I know I I resolved that I would I would do a lot more advocacy for for that because I knew exactly what was going to happen as soon as that Gnome three was released that mm -hmm. there was going to be a huge <coughs> onrush and just about everybody did not want to deal with that and and it that did happen but um patience and constantly explaining what it was if we did we did win uh in in the end right it, mm -hmm. it, it, because everybody uh, um accepts changes at at different rates and some go through a period of um uh huh Morning, exactly, <laughs> exactly, and then you know they get they reach the acceptance <laughs> stage <laughs> at different times, right? So, uh, but it's always it's important that when that goes through. But the advocacy was is something that that I think helped. Uh, I, I, it, it maybe it didn't help externally, but internally, um, knowing that somebody's out there advocating for you. And uh, is is a weight off their minds from from that perspective? So that's, that's a way to react to an, an ongoing problem, right? Mm. Doing this kind of communication. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's um, a post problem reaction. Post problem reaction. Yeah, because you but, can't you can't control what didn't happen yet, right? But. Um, You can to some extent because I think GNOME as a project has some issues with communications in general. And like my talk on GitLab was was really about communication, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and those are those are the things. It's it's when when there's a lack of communication, mm -hmm. then people make up their own stories on why something it is what it is. And so um, and so if there's one part in the bullet point list is communication. It, 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 that's hard to do, I mean, and especially when you, of course, so brilliantly put so many that the tasks a developer has to do. Yeah. Um, one of those things is is maybe some way to to build that communication, mm -hmm. because um, <clears throat> a lot of times uh, people just need to know. And nobody likes to discover something. Um, changed uh, at the time they get it released. They come in, and, and next you know, it's like, what happened? <laughs> and that generally kicks off a whole series of resentment. Right. So, just from observation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, maintainership. If we improve our communication, um, um, will it improve maintainership? Well, I don't know. I, you know, you know, there's there. It's uh, the, the human being is a very interesting creature. But a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of entitlement uh, because they believe that uh, by using the software, they're doing you a favor, not, as opposed to uh, uh, the other way around, where <laughs> yeah, we're, we're we're doing something for ourselves, and then we're jo asking you to join us is is a different thing than oh, so I I use your software, therefore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that's uh, it, it. That's not the right mentality, and uh, and you you should forcibly push back on that. And that's what a good develop, a developer advocate would say is just to draw that line in the sands. Like, no, that's not what it is. People, and look, frequently, I would say that your the worth of your of your comment is based on your history of contribution. The more contributions you have, the more weight you have behind mm -hmm. your opinion. <laughs> it's a duocracy, right? Yeah. Hey, people always say, talk about meritocracy. But but it does, even that's – if you just made them feel good, if, you made, if, you, if they made you feel good, even just saying thank you and things like that, then you're – even that is a is, – is something. I mean, I would feel good if, if someone who praised me a number of times and say, hey, I love this thing. Can you do this? That's, that's a much positive, better approach than – and an entitled person, you know, like like the confident there. Oh, you're not paid. So, yeah, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, that's so. Yeah. Rit? Uh, this is working. Yeah. Um, so you and I have actually spoken about this a number of times, and it turns out that your talk is kind of the 
perfect uh, par partner talk, follow-up talk to my own. Um, so do you mind if I just say a couple of things? Sure, um, go ahead. So uh, I like the way that you've kind of split the, the, the proactive approach, then the reactive approach, and like where, like what can we do at each one of these stages of um, an abuse pipeline, if we want to call it an abuse pipeline? Um, <laughs> maybe not Can you make the that official term. name? <laughs> the abuse pipeline? Abuse pipeline, yeah. It's like a new feature for GitLab. <laughs> um, so, uh, and just some background, I'm a neuroscientist by day, so mental health is a huge important, uh, it's not just professionally important to me, uh, it's also personally important to me. Um, so one of the main points that I made during my talk was humanizing uh, the developers, and I see that as a proactive approach. Right. Um, when you think that the person that, when you, when you see the person on the other end of the Twitter comment as an idea and not a person tearing their life apart and tearing their person apart um, means nothing to you because you're not tearing apart a human being. You're just tearing apart the idea in your mind of a human being. And that's very different. Um, uh, humanizing, I think, the developers for most rational people in society, I think, is a way to curb a lot of the n really, really bad toxicity. Uh, but then again, there are people that have no issue to your face tearing apart your entire life's work um, in a cruel manner. Th that's right. very different. <laughs> You've been doing a lot of work on setting a positive tone for GNOME, right? I'm trying. Uh, I, I try. I'm trying to set a positive voice for for GNOME, and not just GNOME for for setting a positive voice for just. Um, free software, software. anyone, at the whole world, trying to make the internet nicer to each other. Um, so, so that's like a so yeah, the humanizing approach I think is important. And from the from the social media side of things, I've been trying. Um, it's sometimes hard. Uh, it's also because I'm somewhat distant from the rest of the community. We're all distant from each other, but I'm fairly new, and I still don't even know many of the developers, so it's hard for me to humanize people that I don't know, because <laughs> I might be misrepresenting them, and then it's a whole other issue. Uh, so, so that's not a question. That, so that's also a statement. <laughs> um, question that's fine. I, um, yeah. It's, it's an open, open space for comments. Um, hmm. Another thing I'd like to say is uh, about the entitlement side of things. So I think I came into open source. Um, I had been pre-humbled by the college experience of kind of walking in thinking you're a hotshot and then getting your ass royally handed to you by like professors and tests and <laughs> people that are way smarter than you. And so when I started using open source, I think I had a new perspective on life or something. Um, and uh, I saw open source as a gift. I had been paying for software for or paying, you know, as you do via torrent uh, for software for years. Um, and uh, and I saw being given free software and being allowed to be a part of the conversation as, as that I was being gifted and I was being allowed to join the discussion. Um, and I think that when framed in that context, most people understand if you're given a gift for your birthday that isn't quite up to your standards, most people don't throw it in that person's face and say, I hope you die. Um, so, um, not in real life, at least. Not in real right? life. I think most people don't do that. I hope most people don't do that. <laughs> um, there are people that do do that to us, and I think that so either they're very sociopathic or they just don't see it as a gift. They actually are misunderstanding what it is that they're receiving. They have a they have a pre sense of ownership over your time, which is a cognitive dissonance that um, I don't know. It's uh, it's a really hard thing to do. You have to educate. I think the only way to do that is educate or uh, or enlighten in some way, shape, or form. Um, but I have a question. I do have a question. The question that I have for you, <laughs> sure. with everything that I've said, with everything you've said, is uh, I think a lot of it comes down to mental health. Like you were in a right. low spot. I've been in many, many low spots and I'm still, still in a low spot. I'm in grad school. That's the low, that the whole thing's a low spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, what can we be 
what can we be doing to help with mental health? I mean, my university provides me a lot of resources. I have counseling. I have in, I have uh, psychiatric. You know, I can get medications. I, I, I can just talk to people. Um, what can we be doing? Um, we're all volunteers, it's volunteer effort. I mean, we can't even think of funding the project, let alone funding the mental health of the people writing the project. That's like three stages removed. You can't even fund the first stage. So um, right. I don't know what the solution is. How do we protect the mental health of the people involved? Because we do, I showed a tweet on my own talk of somebody who was saying like, the doctor was able to tangibly measure the point at which she stopped contributing to open source just based off her blood antibody panel. <laughs> so um, it's funny, but it's actually really dangerous. That's, that's actually dangerous to humans. And we shouldn't be putting ourselves in danger to give away and gift the world. I mean, maybe, maybe we, we, we're willing to put ourselves in a little danger to give a gift to the world because we're all you know, generous people, but um, it becomes very real. And Do you expect an answer from me? Because no. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> yeah, anyone. Um, we have two people. Can we start with um, Philip and then Federico? Okay. Um, I want to <coughs> maybe share a, uh, um, a way of approaching it that neither you nor Britt have discussed yet, but it's what has worked for me where, um, and I don't, I don't, know if I would recommend this because I'm not sure it's the way that I, I want to approach it, but um, I've, I mean, you were telling me at lunch about how somebody, uh, you know, <laughs> somebody <laughs> threatened to kill your dog on, uh, on GitLab or whatever. Personal uh, email. Oh, personal yeah. email. Okay. It, things, things have never been that bad for me personally, but I, you know, I've seen it happen to other people uh, like you and, and others. And for, for me, that's resulted in, um, you know, seeing myself as living in a bit of a fortress where I only go outside under certain conditions, right? I will engage if I can do that to defend somebody else or to deflect attention from them. Um, or I will, you know, sometimes when I feel like there's, you know, the situation is hopeless, but I engage briefly to leave a record of, uh, you know, how um, I or other people who work on the project uh, feel about something. Or in, in a very rare case when, when I feel like somebody would actually benefit from having an honest answer, then, then I will actually go outside the fortress and engage. Um, but I don't think this is how it should be, but it is. <laughs> It's, it's what works for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's <laughs> something where, I, where I, I feel like, you know, I, I could engage more, but if there's even a 1% chance that somebody is going to threaten to kill my dog, then, I, you know, I don't, <laughs> I just, I, you know, I want to avoid that situation. And so, you know, I go to, uh, you know, I go to Brit's talk yesterday, and, you know, the whole the thing that's running through my head the whole time is, what, you know, actually go to Reddit and talk to these people? My ass. <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, but, you know, this is, this is not good, but it's, it's not bad either, I guess. That's, right. <laughs> that's what I wanted to say. I mean, the laugh in here um, suggests that people also think it's crazy to go to Reddit, right? Because it's such a toxic place, or at least... Um, we collective, collectively allowed it to be at such a toxic place. Um, after Brit's work on on the GNOME sub, it's got so much better. It's a place that we can go now and share a news because there's been heavy moderation. Um, but if you go to the Linux sub, <laughs> well, well deserved. If you go to the Linux R sub. It's, it's you don't go to the Linux R sub, <laughs> right? 
lot better over the past couple of years. I think that's uh, if, is it better? Be the current pleasant, situation is better. Surprise, is much better than it used to be. Yeah, I'm not saying it's perfect. It's still Reddit, but um, I think there's it's yeah a lot less of a cesspool, and <laughs> and there's been a lot of like you know positivity that I've seen there as well. Even right. My uh, proposal of an orbital death ray was canned. Oh, uh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> orbital right. bombardment was not accepted. <laughs> Well, there's always foreign X. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I do think having using things like discourse and modern tools rather than mailing lists where moderation is something that's kind of baked in and expected rather than something that um, admins dread to have to do to the mailing list and it's kind of a nuclear option last resort. I think that really kind of helps enforce an understanding of you know, this is a place to be civil and there's not space for that. Um, while I have the microphone on, let me see my other comment. Too. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that the the um, comment there with the perfectly reasonable, like why aren't you know what's blocking you from contributing, and then anger back at that. Um, I think people's uh, it, it's a lack of understanding about you know the open source development model and what exactly you know what these feedback channels are for and what they can do. I think people are used to making you know a user voice suggestions and proprietary software and things like that. So maybe one idea would be to actually have a channel for user and make it clear like this is user suggestions and you know your your individual suggestions are of very low value because there are lots of suggestions but you know this is a place where users can talk and the idea is like you, you you're not this isn't for contributors this is for you know this is the our ideas and then the ones can bubble to the top then you know they place we, just like, like just like any other course yeah, uh, possibly, or, you know, like, I, I don't know what open source possibilities are like this, but like, you know, the user voice thing, have you seen that? It's like a lot of things that a lot of um, you know, software uses where you basically suggest an idea and then you get, everybody gets three votes or whatever and you can vote them up. That kind of thing, like, like lets people feel empowered to share without being mixed in with the same space where we're trying to get real work done. Um, I don't know, that might, might be one kind of approach because it, it's definitely easy as a open source developer to really develop a very low opinion for people's ideas that are not backed by code. It's like right. the duocracy thing. But on the other hand, you know, they are users who are using this stuff and have valid experience. So there's some balance there. So officializing GitLab as a development focused yeah. platform? Yeah, and kind of use, make, making a separation of story there. Okay. Um, Federico had something to say? Thanks. Uh, I love the idea of having a maintainer's guide. As you said, the, the maintainer's corner we have in the wiki, it's, it's really old It's lacking, content. right? Yeah. Hmm? It's lacking. Yeah, it's very lacking. It's really, really old content. Um, Sri was saying that since many, many years ago, there have been very toxic forums. You know, currently, I guess it's probably LWN and uh, Foronix, the right. notorious ones, because they they refuse to have any sort of moderation. And uh, in the past, there was still Foronix, there was OS News, and all of them have had this sense of entitlement from the, from the people who post there towards the developers. You know, even the editors of OS News had that attitude, and they were at gigantic pain in the ass. Uh, this is going to be announced really during the AGM uh, in the afternoon. We are uh, finalizing the new code of conduct for GNOME. It's going to land really soon. And that will... <laughs> that will uh, allow us to have like clear rules for the official GNOME forums and the question about what makes an official GNOME forum, well, it's one that lives in our infrastructure and we can extend that to the ones that, where we have, uh, <coughs> for example, we have uh, m uh, moderation on Reddit, on the Reddit, our GNOME subreddits and uh, maybe others. Right. Uh, maybe if people want to set up their own forums, if they, if they 
they they can say that they can that they abide by the GNOME code of conduct. In that case, we we cannot offer moderation services because you know we don't have enough people. What we can certainly do is uh, offer them to take uh, incident reports from their forum uh, on their behalf. You know. Uh, but another thing you can do with that is use the, use the trademark. That's what we did. we did this in Fedora. We said if you want to say this is a user Fedora user forum and use the word Fedora in the name, you have to agree. You have uh, you have to agree to the code of conduct, and everybody agree, participating there has to agree to the Fedora code of conduct. Nice. Uh, and that's been we've, we had to um, tell somebody they couldn't call their forum a Fedora forum anymore because of that. So. Um, to me, that was a win. Uh, that's, that, a, so. that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And uh, what was the last thing I wanted to say? Oh, yeah. Uh, Britt was mentioning uh, the need for mental health resources in open source. There's this site called osmihelp.org. Osmihelp. It's like o -S -M -I -Help? open source. Osmihelp.org. It's like open source mental. Open source mental illness. Yeah, open open source mental illness. Or open sourcing. Mental open sourcing mental Ill illness. It's about uh, they do work around awareness of mental illness in open source. Uh, they started as an awareness forum for people to know that there are people with mental illnesses in in open source and how to accommodate for them. And it has also moved to uh, supporting people who, whose mental health is in trouble due to the burdens of development or maintainership. So there's friendly people there. Okay. Um, I see a few hands raised, but I'm Robert Matter. Um, there's Andre. Andre was raising his hand like a minute Okay. Sengi. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope I, I don't sidetrack too much for discussion, um, but but a lot of these behaviors to me also feel like that um, people who write comments don't necessarily understand the software development process or the expectations. Like you're the maintainer, so do everything I want to simplify it. And I don't think that we currently have a page which explains stuff like uh, why has nobody fixed this issue yet? Uh, why wasn't I consulted about these changes? Basically, <laughs> covering covering a little bit that uh, woman and manpower uh, is limited, and that there's no service level agreements, L like the very basics that we probably most of us know how free and open software projects work, but not necessarily somebody who just installed their their Linux machine and has expectations that might be very unrealistic. So that might be another thing to really cover something. and sometimes link to. To do something like that, you know. I can try to set that up, yeah. I wrote it for another project, so, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, who's next? Um, Robert and then Cosimo. <coughs> so uh, I just wanted to make a short point, like, in favor of these people. <laughs> I, I just started contributing rather recently, I would say, like a bit of a year ago or one and a half a year ago. And that's when I kind of changed side. And before that, I think I found myself sometimes also in this angry position on being very interested into what happening, what's happening, but being angry when, not, when I did not understand why something did not happen. And I remember being personally happy, uh, person being angry on you, for example, <laughs> before. Oh, <wow>. And <laughs> I'm sorry to say that you were not the first one. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, Thanks for the honesty. <laughs> yeah, and for me, uh, the big change when I finally kind of understood how things work was happening when I first joined the IRC channel and was finding out that all you guys were hanging out there and actually you were talking about, uh, about lots of stuff, but lots of these information didn't get out to the merge request, so all the outside world didn't have an idea what was actually happening, and everyone was just seeing like 
well, this merge request is hanging around for a month and nobody seems to care. And yeah, I just want to make a point for maybe more, maybe there might be ways for more transparency in our internal communication would allow yeah, more people to understand what we are actually doing. Right. Um, Cosimo? Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, so the point I was going to make was, um, so you see a lot of maintainers burning out. And I think part of the problem is that we're very siloed in GNOME and that each module is is very independent. And so maintainers often feel you're kind of stuck with this this module. And I feel like we could, as a group, help each other out more. Like maybe, maybe you need to take three months off and another maintainer could take over that module for three months. And I hope this, I think maybe there's an opportunity there that we make the boundaries more flexible and have more maintainers who can move around and co-maintain and things like that. I think that would that yeah. would help the situation. We have been we have um a very su successful model in GNOME settings, right? Because yeah, I think it's working. Yeah. No code lands without being revealed and it's a massive module. But and even in that case, I mean I could see you burning out and I was yeah. trying to take over some more stuff and then I I don't know, I feel like it didn't we could have done better at that. We could have perhaps shared the load better. And that could happen with other modules. There could be other people maintaining a module like, I don't know, cheered it and uh, burning out and that they don't know how to stick their hand up and say, I need some help. Can another maintainer help me for three months or, or just get through this release or something? Just a, a little like side note. Yeah, if, you, if you're thinking about like relieving some pressure, just let the release team know. The release team usually can either handle the releases for you so the module doesn't go completely away or at least find a new maintainer or add somebody that can deal with some of the things like pair you up with somebody else. Um, yeah, contact the release team. Don't, don't just assume that nobody's listening. Just, yeah, we're there for also for that. Won't we burn out the release team as well? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> no, <laughs> because we can like co to other people. Um, and the other all, release yeah. team. No, no, no. We we can also yeah we can just get get people into the release team like ha tag you're it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it's probably less of a problem. Also, we don't have like a, a complete attachment to any single project in the in the GNOME like stack. Um, one last question. Yes. Oh. Okay, two last questions. Well, very, very quick. Oh, wow. Um, recently, I just changed the uh, IT industries. I'm working in game development now, oh, server side. <laughs> so uh, I kind of have worked aside, aside with the community management team, and I, I kind of have inside already before that, but. I think it would be very interesting to explore idea for volunteering community management team. Uh, and it can be really practical. For first, it can't give someone, young uh, kid who's really good at communicating and doesn't care about the flame wars going on on internet, he might enjoy them, uh, give the first credit in community management because he wants to try out things. And the second, it would build a safe firewall for all manage all coders which really don't want to be exposed to it, because no matter how hard we would try, it will tear people down. It's 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 everyone who has tried to do that at some point just gives up and says, "There's a contact person, just talk with them. Don't bother me unless it's very serious." I think we should explore that. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, so my comment was kind of uh, similar to what uh, Rob Ansel kind of uh, touched upon. And I, I guess my, my question at the end of the day is what is the right way for us to think about the position of a maintainer? And are all maintainers um, equal? In the sense, like, do they all have the same problem, right? Um, I think the problem that uh, you were, uh, you know, sharing in your in, in your uh, great presentation, by the way, um, is 
you know, a problem that comes with success and uh, like high visibility of the work that you're doing, right? Like if you are uh, just like building a small piece of software, you're like a small, I don't know, like craftsman almost like, you know, in a, in a corner of the world. I mean, who cares what, that people won't even know about that. But if your software becomes very visible uh, and is, is very, is, you know, like a prominent component of something like GNOME exposed to a lot of users, then a lot, of, a lot of users will have opinions about it. And so for me, it's almost like, you know, when you're a maintainer of a small module that you create, you're the craftsman, but when you're, you know, the maintainer of GNOME shell or something like that, you are really in, almost like a, a delegate of a larger community, right? Like you're, you're like representing uh, it's almost like you're, like, you know, like you're a politician in some ways, like, you know, you're, you're representing a lot of interest around that module is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so I don't know if, um, if those two roles have the same, have the same problems, right. Or, you know, face the same, face the same reality. So in my mind, you know, there are certain, there's like a category of, of the software that a project like GNOME produces where it's actually not the right thing for the maintainers themselves, kind of like connecting to what Sri was saying, to be the only people that are accountable for the decisions that are made on that software. There has to be a community, you know, buy-in and support. And, you know, you're, you're, you're basically representing what a larger group of people wanted to do. And, and, and so the accountability cannot stop at you. Right. And, um, yeah. And also, you know, it, many times people that are great at making software, they're not, uh, great at like communicating what the software does or, you know, why certain decisions were, 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 were made or, you know, so we're all in this together kind of, right. Yeah. Okay. We are out of time, yeah. just in time. <laughs> um, thank you everybody. Um, I'm happy that we managed to have a fruitful discussion here. Thank you. Coming up are the two unconference talks. So in this room, the title of the talk is Recruiting Diamonds in the Rough, Fighting Open Source